architecture with Apache Flink. Hello. Um, so, uh, to begin with, uh, let's, let me introduce you Drive Tribe. Uh, it's the world's biggest motoring community and uh, it's essentially a social network for petrol heads. And it was founded by Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond, and James May. That may seem relevant right now, but I'll come back to it later. Uh, it's built on top of the concept of a tribe, which is essentially a group of people that share a common interest. That may be supercars or motorbikes or anything on wheels. Um, those tribes have like uh, their own social feeds, uh, their own discussion boards, their own chat channels. And it, we saw that this model lends itself quite well at naturally fragmented verticals. Uh, as an example, like a 22-year-old Japanese drifter doesn't have much in common with like a 60-year-old Harley Davidson driver, for example. And those two people in the platform do not really need to interact. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the product, it looks a bit like this. It's essentially a collection of feed items uh, alongside the aggregation of the social engagement that each one of them has received. Which, from like that view, it seems pretty simple and boring, right? But if we zoom in a little bit and to see what it takes to actually compute one of them, in order to compute this one, we have to like get Hammond, we have to get Hammond's tribe, we have to get the actual content, would have to actually count the number of views. That's potentially, if that was a table, have like potentially billions of rows. Have to like count the number of comments and the number of bumps. And there are a few other bits, pieces of information. For example, there is a dude that commented underneath. Um, if you have a feed of those, uh, it starts becoming uh, obvious that we need to aggregate a large amount of information in order to produce a single page of those things. So to summarize the problem, we have social feeds containing complex aggregates. Those are potentially algorithmically ranked and those are potentially personalized and that needs to run for like possibly tens of thousands of euros concurrently, right? And how could we solve a problem like this? Uh, let's set a few principles to begin with. A system would have to be scalable. Clarks and Hammond may have tens of millions of followers social media and when you build something like this, you cannot really predict how much people will be on the platform at the same time at the day of launch, for example. Uh, the product has to be performant. All of those consumer applications, low latency is very key. The network, any kind of network like 3G, 4G, etc., adds quite a lot of latency to it, and the users actually tend to abandon applications that are generally slow, take time to load. So from our side of things, it has to be as quick as possible. Has to be extensible because young startups like ours tend to like iterate a lot because until you find your product feed, you may need to actually change the product multiple times. And it has to be maintainable because spaghetti code becomes really expensive over time. A naive approach would be to start with like a three-tier architecture like this one. At the top, we have a set of clients. This can be a mobile application or a web application. And they usually interact via HTTP, which is stateless protocol, with some sort of like API servers that are usually stateless, also called the backend or other names. Those perform really simple tasks, for example, routing or axe control, etc. And when there is something that they need to store to remember for later, they just store it to the database, which is essentially a global shared mutable state that a large number of parallel processes may access at the same time. Like starting simple, we just store our data in the database and then try to compute those aggregated views on the fly, right? But that would probably wouldn't work. We'd need like 10 queries per item. Um, a few of those queries are count queries that are generally very expensive, and we have like a large number of items per page. So potentially, to compute like a full page of those things, we made like 250 queries or something. And that would not work. That would be pretty slow, not performant, and not easy to scale as well. How can we make something like this scale? Like, well, we can aggregate a try time. We can do the heavy lifting when the user is not actually waiting for a response from the server. That thinks that gets hidden from the user, and at three time we can just fetch and sort everything really quickly. The data is there, it's ready to be consumed. And this is pretty performant. However, then the right path starts becoming a bit like this. So if a user wants to actually like something, persist a like, then the server will have to store the like, will have to update some sort of like state for the feed item, 
add one like, for example. If there are other aggregations that we need to update at the same time, for example, the number of likes a user has received, we have to update that as well. And all of those without taking into account multiple different systems that may be in place at the same time. For example, we may index users in a search database, Elasticsearch, to like for search queries. So we may have some sort of cache. And then as this, as the application evolves and more requirements are added in, this write path becomes more and more and more and more expensive. It sounds good. It can't scale. It can't satisfy the requirements. And there are people that have actually started doing that. And it can go a long way. Because before we built a system that we built, like a tri tribe, we had this experience before with a different similar product. And write time aggregations have a few issues. One, the first and foremost, is the concurrent mutations, right? You may have multiple different users that like or comment or do some action at the same time. And at this point, uh, in order to avoid like concurrent mutations that can be destructive, you have to enforce some sort of locking, like either at the application layer, if it's a NoSQL, or like if it's a MySQL database, that will happen at the database layer. And that will like slow down throughput, and the right path may be slow. Also, uh, state mutations are destructive. So if we deploy some sort of version with a really bad bug, and that corrupts the data, and we end up with like minus one followers, etc., that will stay there. And it's not very trivial to debug it as well. So there are a few issues. Additionally, uh, model evolution becomes hard, right? We couple, uh, we tie couple, <laughs> we couple tightly uh, the read and the write models, and it's quite difficult to like upgrade either of them. And nobody likes migrations, especially you have like your live database that all your reads go there, and all of a sudden you need to change something to add a row, remove a row, or like do a bigger factoring. Then you may need to have some downtime if something goes wrong. There are horrible things that can happen. So that doesn't seem to be either extend, neither extensible nor maintainable as a system. So we can take a step back and rethink the problem, right? The clients send facts to the API that uh, someone likes someone else's post, someone updated their profile, etc. And those things are immutable. Those things capture a user action that has happened at some point in time, and this never changes. And those things are a really rich way to actually capture information because Joining a tribe and unjoining a tribe is actually a negative signal. But if we just write and then delete, then we lost that piece of information forever if we don't account for it beforehand. We could actually start by logging all of those events, right? We would have like an append-only log of updates. We could log every state transition that has ever happened to the system. And immutability ensures that we can actually reprocess that log continuously without side effects. So if, for example, we realize later that unjoining a tribe is a really negative signal, and we actually need to factor that in to actually update some sort of ranking model for the tribe, etc., we have the ability to retroactively apply this computation. And this is the essence of event sourcing. Also, event consumers that actually consume stuff from the log not necessarily need to have like the same model. They can produce in the output a model that's completely different from the one that we have in the input, right? And this decouples the read and the write type model into two separate entities that can be implemented, scaled, troubleshot, etc., independently, and that's a QRS. By combining the two things together. Uh, we have immutability that makes reasoning about the system easier. You can have like all the state transitions can be traced and captured. So for example, if you end up with minus one followers, you can take a slice of events that correspond to one key, replace, replay them through the function that actually generate the computation, monitor the output and figure out which point this thing went wrong, as opposed to like just having the final data and not knowing how the data ended there. Also, the separation of concerns between reads and writes provides good flexibility in terms of system design. There are tools that are good at reading, there are tools that are better at writing, etc. And although there are many databases, for example, that are trying to be perfect for everything, there's no such a thing out there, else we would all be using it. And another benefit is that the read model, it's just a projection of the write model, which means that can be easily changed. We can change our mind, deploy a new version of the application, and actually create a new set of projections, a new set of views for the app. And some people call it the kappa approach. Conceptually, that thing like in a diagram would look like this. We'd still have our own clients that like, interact with some sort of like API, which is the forefront of an architecture like this. 
those things write raw events to some sort of event log. And even like with older hardware, that would be pretty fast because that's sequential I.O. essentially. And then we have a number of consumers that would consume raw events. We don't have concurrent mutation there because the consumers which actually fetch data at a rate they are comfortable with, as opposed to having multiple different concurrent requests competing for resources from the same pool of mutable state, which it solves a problem that we actually had there. And then we can produce aggregates, like those are processes that can produce aggregates that will be stored in the DB, and those things can change quite easily, can be debugged quite easily. And the only thing that we, knew we need to do at this stage is to actually change the code and replay the log. And at this point, uh, when the user reads via the API from the DB, everything is read time optimized very quick and yeah, performant. So let's see how this uh, does with our principles. Because reads and writes are recoupled and optimized independently, that solution is both scalable and performant. And because the write model is just a pro the read model is just a prediction, that's wrong there. It can be easily extended, changed without the need to do like painful migrations. And that seems to be pretty extensible and maintainable as an approach to building systems. There are obviously a few trade-offs. Consistency in this system is eventual, so you're not really guaranteed unless you have a layer on top of it to actually handle. Uh, those things, like maybe provisional responses, etc. You cannot really guarantee to read your own writes, which that's maybe a big problem for a few applications. For a social network, the fact that your view count may be updated like 500 milliseconds later, that's not really a problem. But if this is your bank balance, that could be a deal break, and you have to like deal with the system in a different way. Uh, there is also an operation overhead. Instead of having a simple database and a simple set of stateless servers and all the automation tools out there from like Circle CI to everything that are there for quite a while, that actually automate all of those processes and make them very easy, that's not there. Like that domain is actually under development right now. And stuff like the D8 platform that the guys presented today are steps towards the direction of actually automating that process. But for the time being, anyone who embarks on a journey to actually build a system like this would have to take on that significant operational overhead. And also failure scenarios get more complicated. The more moving parts you add to the system, the more complicated it gets. But if you compare that with an architecture that has some database, some search database, some cache, a Spark cluster maybe to do bad jobs, etc., and all the spaghetti connections that happen between them over time, I'm not sure which is simpler of the two. So how can we implement something like that? First, we need a log. And Kafka is the obvious choice. Like It's up there for a while. It's stable. It's distributed, fault-tolerant. It's durable. It's quite fast. It's well understood. There are integrations out there. There is help if someone needs. And we can actually store each business event in its own topic in Kafka. Then we need consumers. And for that, we have Flink. Right? It's scalable. It's performant. It's mature. Really elegant high-level APIs in Scala. Powerful low-level APIs for someone that wants to do like really advanced tuning and stuff. There are multiple battle-tested uh, integrations, and there is actually an active community that is there to help. And as a serving layer, well, in our case, it's just Elasticsearch and Redis. Elasticsearch is used as a queryable document store, and Redis is used to store relations for quick access. But really, that's the least important bit of architecture, because we can completely wipe this off, start with Cassandra, for example, if we or I realize one day that that's the best way to architect our system, replay the log, and then we have like a new serving layer. So putting everything together, it looks like that. Uh, the users interact with a set of stateless um, uh, HTTP servers, RESTful servers that are written with HACK HTTP in Scala. Uh, those servers persist raw events to Kafka. Flink picks up those raw events, does reductions, aggregations, produces normalized views, runs ranking models, personalization models, all sorts of expensive, difficult computations that we have to do and potentially have to iterate and change, etc. And then would store the final result, like the normalized view, the aggregated view that's ready for consumption at Elasticsearch or Redis, where uh, the API can quickly fetch data from. And also Flink handles external integrations like side effects, for example, sending a notification or sending something via WebSocket. And that was the first attempt at a system like this. But this had a few issues. 
And the first one was deployments, right? It's not always possible to have save points. And especially in a young startup like ours, that we change our mind all the time and we want to add another feature, and add another feature, and add another feature, so the, the state in Flink actually changes continuously, the fact that we couldn't always run from a save point was a big problem. So we have to do deployments from scratch and replay the log. Uh, it seemed like a bit of mix of concerns to actually double the capacity of the running cluster so we can deploy the new set of jobs and then we can switch to them and then we can remove the old ones and we thought that we can solve that problem in a more elegant way. And additional problem with this was uh, what I said before that the serving layer is completely dispensable and can wipe it off and replace it with something different. That couldn't happen in an architecture like this. We would have to treat Elasticsearch and Redis as a database which they're not really built for that. So we ended up adding a mirror to the system, right? We automated everything I had to do with like provisioning and uh, installing software and all of those things. So spinning up a second mirror of the first system was pretty easy. So we thought, what? Well, okay, if we want to deploy, we cannot add a replica of the system, its own set of uh, RESTful API processes, its own Flink, its own Elasticsearch, its own Redis, and then we can like deploy code to it, experiment to it, maybe even QA data systems to it, or every data streams to it, or everything. And then we can let it replay, populate the views, we can check it to, think, to see whether it's there, and we get like a hot backup for the live system for free if we just let it run. And then at the point that we are happy with it, we can just change the load balancer from the first, the active system, to the inactive system, to the mirror. Right? And that can go a long way. Uh, but we still had a couple of issues with it. Like messages to external uh, integrations were duplicated. For example, we sent duplicate notifications. So we had to actually deal with that by implementing some sort of item potent sync. But it was a, really a side effect of the design of the system. And the other thing is that many jobs were environment agnostic. They were just performing long-running expensive aggregations that were duplicated and running in both clusters, and we didn't really need to do that. So we ended up adding another cluster, which was just for long-running processes and external integrations. So the two clusters that are like the active in the inactive side are really light. They actually have like a few nodes, and the only thing that need to do is consume data from low compacted topics in Kafka, which is pretty quick, run them through a few models, then produce the views that we need at the serving layer, and then they're ready. And all the heavy lifting with the aggregations, for example, count the number of impressions that Jeremy Clarkson has since the beginning of time, something like that, run on a separate cluster that's actually hardly ever updated, so we can manage the deployment process in a completely different way that is more suitable for that kind of applications. And then we use save points, etc. And additionally, we get the benefit that nothing is duplicated anymore because this is handled separately. I'm pretty sure that we have questions about this. No? Cool. <laughs> uh, well, sorry, wrong button, wrong button. Right? Yeah, sorry. Um, so, um, when you, when you correct the system upstream, right, the one that goes back to the right, mm -hmm. don't you sound like Kafka, would we redo the downstream system as well? So we can, like, rewind it? Ah, should I? Uh, mm. A microphone. Uh, so, when you correct a system on an upstream, right, in one of those black and white um, uh, the the systems? Robot? Yeah, okay. Exactly. Uh, but the downstream system, right, the long run jobs, they keep some state. So yeah, they, yeah. they get uh, again the same data sometimes, I think. So, so do, you, do you sometimes have to correct that downstream system as well? I cannot Rewind really it. think of a case that this is happening. Usually what happens in the middle system, the long running one, is that it produces aggregates that then end in a low compacted topic. And this is just input for the two, the black and the white system. Mm -hmm. So those two things are not really doing the same thing. Uh, yeah. So we assume that everything starts from a low compacted topic in Kafka in that case. So the code that is running in the, three si in the two systems is actually different. It's doing a different thing. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. But let's say that your downstream system is doing a, a, a running average, right? Yeah. And sometimes in an upstream system, in one of those black and white deployments, you rewind the code, but because I understand you are doing that too. I mean, sorry, rewind the topic, the stream. Yeah. That will influence your 
Oh, I understand what you mean. Whether like we may go back in time as far as yeah. the serving layer is concerned. Yeah. Yeah, because we compact them aggressively, that will not happen. Like it could right. be, but if we rewind the system, it's not going to be the active one. So there's the active one that is the one that the load balancer points to, and this is the one that the users are using. If we're going to do a deployment from a save point or replay the Kafka log or anything like that, it's going to be on the inactive side, which means that even if we rewind the system, etc., nobody's really using it at this point. So we can actually monitor the progress of it, and it's quite fascinating because every time you refresh, you actually get a different view, and you can see a view of a feed item from the beginning of time to the current date. It, not exactly possible, but it could be possible. So the input to those long-running jobs is always progressing. It's never being rewinded, right? Yeah. It's always progressing. Yeah. Uh, unless something horrible happens to them, in which case we start from a save point, etc. And this is where the thing is we have uh, data points, like for example impressions and views, etc. That are really billions of them. We cannot always like replay the Kafka log from the beginning of time. We have to expire them at some point. We still have them in cold storage. So in the absolute disaster that we have to replay everything from the beginning of time, that's still possible and we have automated that. But like those bulky items are, are expired over time. But the users, we have them in a lot compacted topic. And if we get that many users that we need to actually expire them, then OK, we're in a hard place. You. You partially answered the first question that I had. Uh, was your retention policy on Kafka? Excuse me? Retention policy on Kafka. You are saying you can replay everything. Oh, forever. yeah. Uh, the retention policy depends on the topic, right? There are topics that have impressions, etc., that we keep them for like three to six months, depending on how bulky they are. And the rest are compacted, and we actually aggressively compact every 30 minutes or something. So even the images you're pushing through Kafka, you're not using any additional storage? Uh, no, Kafka is a source of truth. We do have a way. We do obviously have a cold backup of the data that we can actually rewind via, the Kaf via Kafka to the system. So if, for example, we lose Kafka, we have a way out of this. But that's the point of this. Kafka is the entry point to your application. Uh, that's not quite the question that I I'm was sorry. asking. Uh, let's assume that you're pushing images, and the image size is 10 meg. Kafka oh, no. doesn't like it. No, 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 that doesn't. That, that the was images, the question. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, images get uploaded to, uh, to S3 directly, and then when that gets committed, like this is a different service that is uh, dealing with that because there are bulky items, and Kafka is really for data, live stuff. We're not doing any image recognition, so this is not really a use case. So what we push to Kafka is the metadata of the image, and like a link to um, practically leads to CloudFront essentials. You can retrieve uh, the image via the CDN, but we don't push bulky items there. Right, so you are using Kafka to push the data by reference uh, for the big images. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. The same thing for videos as well. Um, about the consumer side and the code logic in Flink, um, so for the filter project and select that's easy, for the join, did you re-implement something like a, a stream join by yourself? Excuse me? For the join, did you re-implement uh, uh, yourself? Yes. Did you re-implement something like a, a stream join by yourself? Uh, no, the, d the way that we deal with aggregations of like different topics, if this is what you're asking, is that we actually uh, convert them to some sort of like intermediate state that we can then merge them using algebraic abstractions like semigroups and semi-lattices. So we can actually build in commutativity or associativity or any kind of semantics that we need for like merging data, joining data. We can build them in the operator, and that bit can be extracted from the stream and unit tested automatically and quite easily with like libraries like CAT, etc., that you have out there. So we didn't build anything to do that, because that's the biggest problem, that if you assume any kind of ordering of messages that come from different topics, or that uh, we key the stream from with a different topic than the one that is keyed in Kafka, then you cannot assume any ordering. So you need to, if you need some sort of like commutativity or ordering guarantees, you need to build that in your application logic. And this is where the algebraic semantics actually help quite a lot. OK. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, <coughs> I, 
it looks to me like you run on AWS. I was just curious how you how you cope with things like regional failure. You know, Virginia in particular has a lot of issues with S3. Um, there's just a network outage in Ireland. There are other data layer technologies like Cassandra, whatever you could replicate cross region, but this looks like a difficult thing to replicate outside Th of a single thing region. Is we could easily, well, regional failure, that's a really big problem. And right now we don't have a way to deal with that. And if this happens, probably we'll have some downtime. But when they did like the biggest uh, DDoS attack to like the upstream DNS service a few, like it was a few months ago, then even Twitter went down. So in catastrophic failure that actually someone bombs Ireland, then we'll be done at this point. There is a way we could use Mirror Maker to actually replicate Kafka somewhere else and then have the whole copy of the infrastructure, etc. But this adds cost for a scenario that is extremely catastrophic. What we actually do, and we could, like in a really big disaster, is the external system in which we do the backups, it's BigQuery actually, it's the Google Cloud. Mm -hmm. And this is so actually we have a copy of the data both in Amazon and in Google. So if something horribly wrong happens to Amazon, we have everything automated and we can spin up in a different data center, everything, and then stream from BigQuery everything through Kafka and populate the system. That's going to take a few hours, and that would have, I don't know, it would need a really big fire in Ireland to actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> need to do that. But yeah, we thought about that. We are paranoid enough. <coughs> so um, how do you actually, even for the same topic, how do you guarantee the ordering of events? Because the load balancer could go to any of the front-end servers. So for the same user, if you're like adding and deleting, there's We're no guarantee. You're using keyed partitions, and you can actually have a key. So it is really important the way each message has a key. So we have like an event type class that has a definition of an ID, and we need to implement that for each one of them. And this need to be kind of unique for each entity. So for the user, all the events that correspond to like a user profile need to go to the same partition so we can have the ordering guarantees. I understand, but even for the same partition, how do you guarantee ordering? Because if two different producers writing to the same partition, there is no guarantee of ordering. Uh, that's a different causality issue. But in social networks that actually depend on user actions, that usually there is some time between them. You mean that if someone manages somehow to update his profile concurrently, in th that's a bit well, of like not a even concurrently, right? Because if I add something and I delete something, if they go to different front-end servers, they have different producers. There is no causal dependency between those producers. I understand what you mean. And we may end up there and think is, we thought about this, and you can solve that by having like some sort of commutative operator after that. But this needs to happen in order to actually invest the time to debug this sort of thing, this sort of thing. So the yeah. thing is, we haven't really run into that problem up to now. It's technically possible, but. Okay. There are many kinds of failures that we can have. So, and <coughs> one last question for the: uh, Have you tested running Flink in batch mode and sort of the Kappa architecture? Actually, go with the Lambda architecture, but have the same approach. In sort of Kafka, you can actually read from Parquet or, or Hadoop. Uh, we never tried that. No, it's okay. one of those things. Uh, in that architecture, we start with that architecture, and still we haven't. After like more than a year into the project. We haven't found a use case that we actually need to do bots. Okay. And that simplifies things down the line because in a traditional system you would have to add this ability. We haven't had to add anything like in a year. Fair enough. And to actually if to answer the question if this really simplifies things. I have like a code sample, which is a way to count big numbers in real time. We know that this is not a really, it may sound trivial, but it's not. If you have like millions of events with like hundreds of thousands of different keys, and you know to produce like real time counters to update the dashboard or use them in a front end or run them through a model, it's not a trivial thing. But in Flink, it really looks like that. So all we need to do is if we define a model for our events, if this is likes, it will have like some sort of user ID, some sort of post ID, some sort of timestamp. We define some sort of model for the counter state, which is something that will live in Flink, which in this case, it would be like a post ID, and we'll have a counter, which is a hyperlog log. But you can use like um, 
the counter of your preference, and we have like some sort of output. In this case, like it's just a plain like count. If we then define a single function for it, and we know that reducers in Flink need to be associative, so we can use a semigroup there and automatically check it for correctness, then the final stream looks like this. So with five lines of code, Flink abstracts all the complexity that has to do with managing network buffers and network connections and distributed computations and fault tolerance and checkpoints and everything. And th what the user that the, the programmer sees is just that, which looks like pretty much like the Scala collections. If you do like functional programming in Scala, Martin, Martin Oderkis course, course in Coursera, one of the first courses about Scala collections and the examples pretty much look like this. If we just want to add a time element to this and make this trending post or something, with a single line of code, we can add a window there, a sliding window that gets updated every two minutes, and then we have our results pretty quickly. So there is a time investment and a learning curve when you start building systems in that way. So it may be a bit intimidating to begin with, but there is lots of simplicity that you get back once this is done and it's running. In a sense that features that would need an architecture session to add another component and people to discuss how to do this, etc., can be implemented with like a few lines of code in an architecture like this. Uh, any more questions? Okay, thank you guys. Thank you.